The Rebel Capitalist Show. Carbon credits. Carbon. So Carbon explain, credits. can you explain those, please? For sure. So let's take an oil company. Let's take Exxon, right? So Exxon, when they pump oil out of the ground, you know, when you see a jack every time they pump that out, there's a S1 emission associated with that. There's a carbon dioxide, a carbon dioxide equivalent, CO2E, that comes out of the ground. The companies have legislated themselves that they need to decrease their carbon footprint. Now, there's a couple of ways the companies can do this. They can go and invest in a project, develop it. For example, Apple just came out with a 30,000 hectare, uh, sorry, acre project in, uh, it's called a mangrove blue carbon. It's forests in the ocean because per square foot, uh, the ocean absorbs 10 times what a terrestrial forest can. Then you get mm. the secondary benefits of marine habitat. You're protecting the corals, the algae, the whales, the sharks, the turtles. It's good for the climate. It's good for the people. And then what Apple wants to do is as they get certified by an independent certifier of these carbon credits, they can put that onto their balance sheet and say, hey, we produce X amount of carbon dioxide, but we're negating it by sequestering it in the market or like Microsoft, they buy, the, they buy these carbon credits, that market alone, then they go over net neutral. That's going to be the phrase over the next 20 years is net neutral. So that's mm -hmm. one aspect. Exxon, Shell, they're looking to buy these credits and you can create projects, get involved in projects where you can start up for very little cost. Like think about what we got to do to buy, build a gold mine. You got to go find the gold, then you got to drill it out to see if it's economic at certain prices. Then after you put all those, it costs about $100 million in drilling to prove something tangible out. Then you got to apply for permits, hopefully get them. Then you got to raise the money to build the mine. And then hopefully you build it on time and on budget. And then when you build it, hopefully it all hangs together. Because remember, you're just taking drills. You're not taking a pure slice of the deposit. You're, you're kind of doing a statistical model. And then there's risk that, oh, and by the way, you don't know what the price of gold or copper is going to be by the time you build it. So there's a lot of risk. In the carbon credit market, it's a gift and good. A gift and good is so key. I talk about this in my book. A gift and good is rarely taught in economics anymore because it's this abstract thought. What a gift and good is, is if it's not replaceable, you can't replace a carbon credit. It's not like I can create a nitrogen credit and then say, oh, but it's almost as good. Like, you know how gold and silver or rare earths are competitive with another catalytic converters, palladium, platinum, they're, they're competitive. You can replace one another with alchemy and you, you, you metallurgy. There's no replacement for carbon credits. And as the price goes up, the demand goes up. Now, why is that? Because when companies like Shell want to buy these carbon credits, it's going to reduce their cost of capital. It's going to increase their shareholder base. They're going to make more money from doing this. And then guys at Exxon and Shell are going, holy shit, they're getting better free cash flow per share than we are. We better jump on this too. And that's why as the price goes up, the demand goes up. Mm. And in Europe, right now, it's trading over 60 bucks a ton. You can go and buy these in the stock market. And the government in the EU is saying, still not expensive enough. We want to go and do this at over 100 euros. So over 120, they want to double the price of carbon in Europe. And here in America, in North America, in South America, you can build these projects for eight, 10 bucks a ton, sell it to the majors for 20, 30 bucks, and it's still half the price of what you can sell to the Europeans. The economics on this, on a supply and demand, I have never seen such a strong bullish case on the demand side where supply, it's not like I can just create a carbon credit out of thin air. How are they created? By the government? No. See, that's the beauty of this. This is not a tax. The government cannot. You never want to get involved. Or, or, or it's, it's, so it's not like a Tesla where they're giving them a, a, a credit for future tax Correct. code and then they can sell that. So in, in a, look, Elon is hinted. He's going to get into this in a big way. How he got his credits was the fuel switch option. So for example, George, you're a big utility and you have this uh, thousand megawatt coal mine, uh, coal project. And, and I say, hey, George, if we build this wind farm for 200 megawatts and you reduce your coal usage by 200, you're going to switch 200 dirty megawatts to clean. You're going to get a carbon credit for that switching. That's how Elon Musk got those credits because- the And then that, those, those credits are some sort of tangible, there's some sort of asset that you can- well, Because other people needed those credits who build a dirty car and they had to go net net, right? So he would sell it. And 
you know, some argue that that was more value than the car itself, right? He was making a lot of money from that. And that's why, what, is it just coincidence? He's now talking about the green Bitcoin and we need more carbon. And he gave a hundred million dollar prize to whoever solves the carbon. Come on, there's no, there's no uh, framework to those, uh, uh, the contest rule. Maybe a contest that doesn't have rules, right? Elon Musk is brilliant. Mm. He's very good at manipulating the media. But he's going into these carbon credits in a way bigger fashion than it's even hinted. That's mm. that's the game. So how you can go and create it. For example, my favorite carbon credits are blue carbon credits. What a blue carbon credit is, is about 14 million acres of uh, mangroves on the planet. That's okay. about the size of all of California and New York State. So take the two biggest econo- economies of America, put them together. And what mangroves are, is they're trees that grow in the ocean that are about 70% in the ocean, 30% above the water. Yeah. And because of Chinese farming of shrimp, they are doing the biggest deforestation, more so than the Amazon. Now, Amazon gets a lot of the media. Nobody is talking about what's going on in the mangrove forest because it's the perfect habitat to grow shrimp, right? So what happens there? Well, the sharks, the turtles, the, the whales, they're getting massively devastated because of these mangroves. Now, when you can go and prevent, there's a cost to prevent the harvesting of these mangroves to grow shrimp. And then you can expand and, and, and monitor these mangrove forests and let them thrive. Then by protecting these things, you, you, you get the rights to these projects. You bring in the technology, you get them certified. There's an independent, you know, just like how you get an auditor say, there's 5 million ounces in this gold deposit and here's all the data. It's the same thing for carbon credits. Then those carbon credits get issued to you, and then you can go sell them to Exxon or Shell. But who, who issues the carbon credits? So there's five uh, certified body main ones in the world. You know, 25 years ago, there was 20, but now the industry's got into a point. Someone like a Vera, they're one of the, probably the biggest in the world. Um, oh, I see. It's like an exchange, like the New York Stock Exchange, the mm. securities exchange says, you're ready to trade. You, it's kind of like PwC when they audit your financials. You know, who does it? Well, there's PwC, there's Deloitte, there's Ernst & Young. Yeah. There's, you know, a certified body that say, hey, we certify these. And then when Amazon or Chevron or whoever buys them, they can use that. It's on the blockchain. It shows exactly what year the credit was issued, what project, you know, who the certifier was, who the company was. So you're not buying some junk you know, there's no such thing as like you're buying a Chinese certified carbon credit. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, like a fake econo- one. <laughs> like the economics on this, George, just I want to explain to people and I talk about it in my book. If you take just $10 a carbon right now, there's companies out there that are doing this. If you take $10, remember, it's trading at 60 bucks in Europe, but let's just take one sixth of the value. So imagine you take the gold price and divide it by six. Okay. So we're talking about, let's say 200 and $50 gold. There's companies out there right now that are doing IRRs four times what the precious metal guys are doing at $1,800 gold at $10 carbon. The math on this is going to blow your mind. So guys like Doug Casey, who are my good buddies, very close. I manage his money. Okay. He's part of that old school, like, ow, man, what are you talking about? These carbon credits. You know, and like as I walk through <laughs> while he goes, he's smoking his cigar and sipping yeah, his and whiskey. He goes, <laughs> and then he, you know, he's got his thing and he, you know, he's playing his poker and he goes, ah, Yeah, right, right. Tell me more about these carbon credits. How can I own more of them? Right. That's if I can take someone like Doug Casey, who's investing millions into this, you may want to pay attention to it. Look, George, I've done a lot of pretty cool projects in my life. I have never had a bigger tiger by the tail. And I just want to share this with everyone. It's my last book, it's my hurrah. I'm done. Hopefully people read it and expand their horizons.